webinar um, that's going to largely cover the 2020 NGBS. My name is Michelle Foster. I work at Home Innovation. Um, I'm joined with the Home Innovation Green Team. Um, so Cindy Wasser is on the line and Ann Holt-Schmidt. So if you have questions at the end of the presentation for any of us, I would welcome you to ask them. I think largely I'd like to have most of the questions held until the end unless there's really something burning um, that you have to clarify right then and there. And then like I said, as long as it stays quiet and everybody keeps themselves on mute, um, you should be able to interrupt and ask a question. Um, just for logistics, um, I have 78 slides to go through in about 60 minutes, so that's a lot. I'm going to cover stuff really super fast. Um, but we are recording this and we'll make it available on our website at www.homeinnovation.com backslash green under the resources section. Um, I'm not going to cover every single bullet and word on the slide, but you'll have it for access. I really want to get, get those high level concepts out there. Um, and like I said, it's largely going to focus on the 2020 NGBS, although I'm going to just cover a little bit of overview for those who may be a little bit newer to the NGBS or NGBS Green Certification Program um, to get us started. Um, last, um, just about every single picture you're going to see in the presentation is a building that is either in process or has been certified by NGBS Green. So I hope you enjoy the variety of buildings that we have been certifying over the years. So again, as basic overview, um, for those of you who are less familiar, the National Green Building Standard, ICC ASHRAE 700, was developed about 10 years ago to be a voluntary above code green certification program. And it was intended to be used for all buildings that were used residentially, places where people live, eat, sleep. And we're gonna talk about that and how some of the changes are in the 2020 going forward with regards to that. Um, it is ANSI approved, and in fact, the 2020 NGBS was recently approved by ANSI, which is why we were starting to talk about it and wanting people to know about what the changes are. And it's part of the ICC suite of I codes. And what that also means, it's an alternative compliance path for the International Green Construction Code, the IGCC. For those buildings in the country, um, and including some areas of the Caribbean, um, if the building is being used residentially, the NGBS Green Certification Program is the most used green building certification program nationally. So that's been something we've been very excited about. And if you look at this slide, you can really see the growth of the program over the past 10 years that we've been in business. So single family homes, which is represented by the yellow, has done okay over the 10 years. By far the growth of the program has been in multifamily shown by the blue on this slide, and you can really see some tremendous growth year over year in the program. I also like to show our NGBS screen stats. I just pulled this this morning, so it's current and up to date. You can always see our current stats on our website at homeinnovation.com backslash green. Um, and two columns in particular to see the green boxes, which are those certified units in multifamily buildings and certified single family homes. Oh, I didn't, sorry, 16,701 single family homes. Um, but then you can see the new multifamily building units, 182,000 roughly, and then a huge increase in the number of renovated apartments, 6,800 roughly that have been certified so far. But then equally important, while we do have 5,500 single family homes in process, um, we've been able to maintain that large number of apartments, either new construction, about 132,000, or renovation, an additional 6,000. So the program has continued to grow, and as I mentioned, we're seeing some tremendous increases, not only in new construction, but also in renovated multifamily buildings. And we'll talk a little bit about the changes in the 2020s, specifically for renovation. As a very quick review, many of you will know there have been four versions of the NGBS so far. 2009 has been retired and is no longer used anymore. The 2012 NGBS, the registration deadline has passed. However, we do still have some buildings who are in process for certification. And depending on what state they're in, they have until 2021 or 2022 to complete that construction. The most used version right now is the 2015 NGBS. And then um, we will shortly be rolling out the 2020 version for projects to be able to register um, and start that. We haven't actually opened up that registration process, 
we will wait until the actual standard is available um, for everybody to be able to get a copy of the standard and then we'll make a big announcement sending that out to all of our verifiers and our um, builders and developers and architects that we work with when registration is open. Again, briefly as review, the way NGBS um, compliance works is that the buildings have to meet all of the mandatory practices. There aren't that many of them, but for those that are mandatory, there are no exemptions. In general, they do not earn the building points towards certification. And the reason that there are those mandatory provisions is essentially to ensure that baseline building performance nationwide. But instead, the NGBS is a very flexible point-based system. And so there are lots of different practices to choose. In general, the points, um, the number of points that are awarded are based on the difficulty level of that particular practice. And the practices can be not only at the design stage, but also product or system selection or equipment, um, and then construction-based practices. NGBS is really comprehensive in the fact that it's looking to see not only was the building designed to be high-performing, but was it actually constructed to be um, high-performing. One of the things that makes the NGBS so rigorous is that there are minimum points required in each of the six um, green building categories. And then, of course, NGBS Green Certification, the program that we run, has 100% independent third-party on-site verification. Um, again, to familiarize yourself with the threshold point rating table, so what this is saying is that these are the minimum points that are required in each one of those six categories of green building practices. So the big fat column in the middle of those six categories of green building practices, the points depending on the level the building is seeking, bronze, silver, gold, or emerald are the requirements to get that level. And you'll see, of course, as you go up in certification level that you need more points, more practices in every single one of the six categories in order to get certified at that additional level, uh, for that additional level, or you'll be judged at the lower level. So if you're looking for silver, but for whatever reason the building could only get 40 points in energy efficiency, the whole building would get certified at bronze. Having said that, it's still very flexible. There's the additional points from any category section, which we call kind of designer's choice, those practices and products and equipment that make the most sense for that building, depending on its climate or geography or price point. And then of course, the total number of points for bronze requiring 231 points when there's over 1,100 points in the NGBS to choose from. So rigorous, but at the same time, having lots of flexibility. So that's the overview. Hopefully you're all familiar with that. Let's jump into what the revisions are coming in the new 2020 NGBS that you can expect. First and foremost, um, big change was an expanded definition of residential for the scope. Um, second big change is in addition to the performance path that has been there um, for the past 10 years for energy efficiency, there's now a water efficiency performance path there is a new certified level for homes, townhomes, and duplexes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity to perhaps get, perhaps get more single-family homes coming to the program and getting certified with that. And then another big change is that um, because so many of the buildings that were coming through the program to earn certification were mixed-use buildings that have some commercial and retail space, there's now two new options to have that space certified, either core and shell or the full fitted out commercial space um, certification. And then last but not least by any stretch is the um, wholesale revision of the renovation chapter. Um, there were some really important changes that were made there to make, um, hopefully incentivize even more buildings that are existing to come through and get NGBS green certification. And, and I'll talk about those in more detail going forward. To start off with, like every version of the NGBS, um, it sets a baseline um, of the different ICCI codes for baseline performance. And so for the 2020 NGBS, the 2018 IECC, the 2018 IRC, and the 2018 IBC sets that performance baseline for buildings that are coming in. There are numerous references to these codes in the NGBS and of course, all of our partners, whether they be verifiers or architects, um, builders or developers should have access to be able to make reference to those code provisions that are referenced in the NGBS. And then as always, local codes 
requirements are irrelevant with regard to NGBS Green certification unless the local code prohibits an NGBS practice. So what I mean by that is it doesn't really make a difference if, for example, the state has adopted the 2018 IECC but made a bunch of amendments to it. The buildings that are coming in that are seeking NGBS green certification are going to have to be compliant with those provisions if they are in the 2020 NGBS, regardless of what that local jurisdiction has adopted by code, unless they have prohibited something specific. And that would be the only time that local code would trump the NGBS. So let's start first and foremost with the um, scope expansion. Um, we believe it'll provide opportunities for more NGBS green certification, have more buildings to be able to find our program, um, provide value for them and to use our program. So the scope of the NGBS is residentially used buildings, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that and how the definition changed in the 2020. Um, it always had included the residential portions of mixed-use buildings, and that, of course, stays. It also includes mixed-use buildings where the residential portion is greater than 50% of the gross floor area. Um, and so that would mean, obviously, that the commercial space has to be less than that, and then we'd be able to certify the whole building. And then, of course, Chapter 4, which is land development and subdivisions. So the first big change with regard to scope um, definition was the way the NGBS defines residential. So as many of you know, um, when people talk about building codes, they will often talk about residential, meaning those buildings that are following the IRC, and then a building becomes commercial, even if it's multifamily, once it starts to follow the IBC. The NGBS took a much more expansive view, and they really wanted to capture what are those types of buildings that people essentially live in and they're doing activities like sleeping, eating, they have sanitation facilities, they're living, they're cooking. And so in the NGBS 2020, it says residential consider, uh, includes buildings within the IRC scope, group R occupancies in the IBC, and then in addition, assisted living facilities, residential board and care facilities and group I-1 occupancy as defined in the IBC would be considered residential for purposes of the NGBS and being included within its scope. So if you look in the IBC residential group R, what you'll see is there's also this kind of um, a a conglomeration of different things, but they're essentially buildings that people are living in. So boarding houses, congregate living facilities, convents and monasteries, um, dorms, fraternities, assisted living facilities. So as we had been increasingly asked by developers who were doing seniors housing that had some assisted living facilities, maybe some memory care units, um, even hotels or motels that didn't previously meet the dwelling unit definition, now those buildings will be able to come and get certified using the NGBS and earn NGBS green certification. Related to that, um, in the NGBS currently is a definition for dwelling unit. Added to the new 2020 NGBS is a definition for sleeping unit, which again recognizes that sometimes rooms or apartments or spaces that you live in don't always include living, eating, and sanitation and kitchen facilities. And so here it gives a little bit more flexibility for us to be able to look at places, for example, like hotels. So it's really recognizing that the expanded scope is gonna cover buildings that might not meet that dwelling unit definition. So those are the kind of big over um, arching changes that had to do with scope. Um, what I'd like to do now is go into some of the specific changes for the different chapters. But again, I wanna make sure understanding that I'm not gonna go um, and cover every single practice that changed or requirement that changed in the different chapters, and I'm definitely not gonna cover chapter four, which is land development. I'm gonna start off with chapter five. But this should give you an overview of really what some of the really big changes are, um, and, and looking forward what you can see in the different chapters. So let's start off with chapter five, which is lot design preparation and development. First and foremost, the big headlines are there are no new mandatory practices. And secondly, there were no threshold point changes. So 
the points that were required carry forward from the 2015, it'll be the same point structure for the four different levels of certification. There were a lot of new practices added to this chapter that earn points towards certification. So nothing new mandatory, but lots of different ways that buildings can earn points. Um, there were practices added that were looking to promote lots and sites that have good walkability, that provide bike short, um, storage, or have shared use, either cars, vehicles, or shared bikes. Bike sharing is becoming increasingly common in many urban areas. Um, compliance with the International Wildland Urban Interface Code, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. Points if CNG vehicle refueling um, was provided, as well as on-site recreation space. Um, and then some additional points with regard to having high intersection density. I'm gonna talk about that specifically so you know what that means. And then smoking prohibitions and on-site dedicated recreational space. So again, as I mentioned, there were a number of different points that was really intended to kind of facilitate multimodal transportation, getting people out of having to rely solely on a car for getting around. So providing enclosed storage for bicycles or covered bike parking spaces will earn points. Um, certainly any community that has access to shared vehicle use, whether it's zip car, or flex car, or one of the other programs, and then a lot within a half a mile of a bike sharing program would also be able to earn points. Something very new, um, and we have had at least one building have this issue that was seeking certification recently, um, is recognition of the International Wildland Urban Interface Code. And so this was really um, a new practice that references, references that code and it was intended to supplement local fire and building codes so that if the local jurisdiction had not declared a wildland urban interface area, but another qualified party felt that there was a hazard and steps were taken that the hazards were mitigated, there would be points for that building going forward. Um, I mentioned this earlier, there is a new practice that awards points if the area is, uh, if the lot is in an area of high intersection density. There have been a lot of planning studies around people will walk more when there are more intersections. So if there's a lot that is within an area that has at least 90 intersections per square mile, then that lot can earn points for that um, feature of that neighborhood. Also new was um, a practice that provides points for smoking prohibitions for a building. This is available specifically for multifamily buildings and mixed use lots. Um, and depending on where smoking is prohibited and how it is signed, there's a number of different points that are available for a building to earn up to nine um, points, um, a good chunk of points for this particular chapter if that's put into place. And then, New again to chapter five was practices that encourage um, on-site recreation space being provided. This space could be available for either adults or children. It can be either inside or outside space. And then if you have the ability to use this space at nighttime, so if it's an outdoor lot um, play area like this one and there's lighting, there would be additional points for being able to provide that lighting. Um, so this was really one of the multiple new practices that was designed to promote resident health and wellness that you'll see kind of sprinkled throughout the 2020. Um, and with that specifically, I'm not gonna talk about that today because there's just not enough time, um, but we will be rolling out a series of new marketing materials for builders and developers who are using NGBS Green certification to recognize that there are a lot more practices that promote wellness. Um, this will be our um, NGBS Green Plus badge program, and so if you're interested in that, I highly encourage you to be on the lookout for those materials or contact us directly to find out more about what that would be about. And wellness is just one of six different badge opportunities we will have going forward um, to recognize those. Um, chapter six, resource efficiency. The headlines here are there are lots of new practices and new mandatory practice. So um, this is definitely one to take a look at and make sure you're familiar with it. Um, there were new voluntary practices with regard to recycling and waste management. 
There's a whole new section on product declarations, a new section on resilient construction, which I am going to talk about in detail. I'm not going to talk about some of the other ones. And no threshold point changes. So that didn't change from the 2015. So one of the new um, sections in Chapter 6 is on resilient construction. And I think this um, arose out of the growing awareness um, of the different hazards um, around um, and the fact that construction can be built and designed to be a little bit more resilient. Um, so there are six new practices in this particular section. There are up to 15 points available. And one of the things that I really like about this is it really complements, um, for those of you who know, um, in the last few rounds of HUD's disaster recovery funding requirements, they have required a green certification in order to be eligible for those funds. So I think in particular that this practice will be great going forward for architects and maybe builders to consider if this is something that they may want to um, incorporate into their next design. Um, just briefly to show you the practice, there is a series of different choices you can make and then depending on just how much um, more resilient the construction is, the points increase accordingly. Um, and again, unfortunately, there's not time to go into this in detail, but I thought this was one of the biggest, most important changes to Chapter 6 to point out. Chapter 7, energy efficiency. Um, the headlines here, again, is that the baseline performance level is going to be the 2018 IECC. The consensus committee wanted to really work on providing um, more flexibility for um, builders and developers to get to those performance level. There's a new alternative gold energy compliance path. There is a new ERI target compliance path. And there are six new innovative practices that earn points. So the compliance options going forward, um, we always had the performance path, um, which is 702. There was always the prescriptive path, 703. There is the ERI target path, which is 704. Regardless of which one of those three paths you're choosing, you're going to have to do the practices in 701. That's mandatory for Chapter 7 compliance. And in addition, you have to do either two practices from 705 or, and this was a little bit more flexibility than compared to the 2015, one from 705 and one from Section 706. Um, and then, as you're familiar, um, performance path is going to require modeling. Um, you can get any one of the four certification levels for that, bronze, silver, gold, or emerald. Prescriptive path, you're going to be limited to only getting bronze, silver, or gold. So if you're going to go for emerald, you're going to have to move into that performance path, or you can choose the ERI target path, Section 704. That will also get you bronze, silver, gold, or emerald. I also want to make sure that you know about the alternative Chapter 7 compliance path, these were put in there for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, if you're using the Energy Star program, whether you're using the Energy Star for homes or the Energy Star multifamily program, you can attain compliance with Chapter 7 by using those programs. Depending on which version you're using, we'll say whether or not you're going to use bronze, uh, whether or not you'll be able to earn bronze, or whether or not you'll be able to earn silver. And then again, in recognition of the fact that um, the tropical zone is really very different. The construction type is different. Many of those buildings don't have any HVAC. There is a tropical zone compliance path um, that buildings can use. And we're actually seeing um, a fair number of buildings that are coming in in Puerto Rico. We've done some in the Caribbean, elsewhere, and some of the other islands using this tropical zone to be compliant and earn NGBS green certification. Um, one of the changes for the performance path specifically I wanted to point out is that the 2020 NGBS specifically adds on-site renewable energy generation for the cost savings calculation that was not specifically listed for the 2015. And then again, it sets what the reference design is for the tropical climate zone um, and references the IECC R401.2. Um, on the prescriptive path, one of the important changes, I believe, is that it added envelope leakage rate, or ELR, as an alternative metric to ACH to calculate building envelope leakage. I think this will be important particularly for smaller homes or even perhaps multifamily buildings where 
one might say that ACH um, is not as favorable to them in calculating um, tightness. So that will be an option going forward. And then it also clarifies some of the SHGC requirements that have to be met for the UA analysis and updated the fenestration to the 2018 IACC. Last, as I mentioned, there were six new innovative practices that were added that will earn points towards certification, including that CNG vehicle fuel station, battery storage system, smart ventilation, entry airway seal, and the other one that I do want to mention because I do think it's important, third-party utility benchmarking services. So again, this was a really great um, smart ad, I think, for the 2020 NGBS. We have a lot of buildings, perhaps some of you um, have done them yourselves or worked on them. A lot of multifamily buildings that are taking advantage of the HUD mortgage insurance premium reduction. And part of that program, one of the requirements they have is that the building does have to benchmark their energy use using portfolio manager. So now the building can earn points towards certification for doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is a great practice to add to be able to um, have buildings earn points towards certification. Chapter eight is water efficiency and certainly was one of those chapters that had um, some really big changes. So um, new practices, six new in total, one new mandatory, so that's really important. Um, but really big change was in addition to the traditional prescriptive path for water efficiency where you're implementing a series of practices and earning points to them and having to meet those point minimum requirements, there is a new water performance path or WRI. Um, so entirely different um, path towards certification for compliance. There were lots and lots of revisions to either the points available and or the flow rates of fixtures that are eligible to earn points. I'm definitely not going to cover those here. I encourage you to make sure you're familiar with them when you can get a copy of the standard so you can see the differences in comparison to the 2015, but also no threshold point changes. So those carried over and stay the same as the 2015. I did want to mention though specifically, there is a new practice for water usage metering. And again, I think this is getting to that whole concept and philosophy about we're building these, we're designing, we're constructing these high performance buildings. Um, and then we don't have a lot of data on how they're performing in the future. Um, it's a lot harder. Um, it's legitimately difficult to get that kind of information for multifamily buildings or single family homes, unlike commercial buildings. And so this is a step forward to sort of provide an incentive for building owners and um, developers to be able to provide um, water meters so that we can see is the building actually performing with regard to water efficiency the way it was expected. Um, however, you, the point is not available if the local jurisdiction would require the meter. So again, we're trying to really incentivize that above code. And I point this out um, largely because I'm always surprised when I look at how many buildings we're certifying have pools, but going forward, pools are going to have to have a dedicated meter to measure water supply to the pool of spa. And then if an automated motorized non-permeable pool cover is provided, there's 10 points for that. So kind of a large amount of points enabled and being able to provide the cover, but also very important that they have to have a dedicated meter. So, but the big change in chapter eight for sure was the water performance path or WRI. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is um, a water rating index very similar if you're familiar to the HERS index, where it's a score of zero to 100 based on expected water use. Lower is better. And the points are achieved through calculations from site water conservation data and verifier confirmation. So the certification level is really going to be based on what the expected water savings is for that particular building. In the new 2020 NGBS Green Scoring Tools, um, there will be a new tab that will be the WRI calculator. Um, there will be one in the single family and the multifamily new construction and also in the single family certified. So this will be very new um, going forward and in addition, 
we are going to require verifiers to have some additional training if they would like to use the WRI path for any of their projects. And at some point in the future, <coughs> excuse me, we will offer additional training, webinars just like this for architects, builders, and developers so that we can do a really proper deep dive into WRI so that you can understand it. This is giving you such a high level um, and, uh, we, and I understand not really explaining how it's done. Um, the key components for water efficiency is really looking at all water use. So indoor, um, what are all the ways that that particular unit is going to be using indoor water? What are all the ways that it uses water for outdoor use and then water capture for reuse? So it is a really comprehensive tool. Um, we think it'll provide great flexibility going forward. Um, and we're looking forward to sort of seeing how this can be implemented in the field um, to show compliance for building seeking NGBS green certification. Chapter nine, um, indoor environmental quality. Um, the headlines here were, again, no threshold point changes. There are definitely new mandatory practices. I'm gonna talk about that briefly here. Um, and then lots of new voluntary practices. Um, I will mention a couple here. I'm not gonna speak to all of them, but again, new ways, new opportunities for buildings to earn points towards certification in chapter nine. One of the new mandatory requirements is radon testing. It is mandatory for zone one, unless the occupied um, space unless the occupied space is located above unenclosed space. So let me explain what that means. We're thinking about that. So if you have, a, let's say, four-story multifamily building, it's a podium-style construction, that first floor is parking, it's got mechanical ventilation, it's not enclosed, then you wouldn't be mandatory. But otherwise, if you're a building in zone one, you're gonna have to do radon testing. The practice in the 2020 provides really detailed instructions on how to go about that testing. And then importantly, the test results have to be included in the construction documents provided to the owner. And I know there was a little concern when I was talking to a group of architects last week about this. I think what we're really looking at this going forward is for the test results to be put in those operation and maintenance manuals that you're doing for chapter 10. So we're not necessarily asking that they be directly incorporated into the construction drawings that have been done at this point already. Um, and then if the result is above a minimum, the radon fan has to be installed. So very important to sort of figure that out, what the test result's gonna be, or do the test, but plan for the fan from the beginning anyway. Another new mandatory um, practice is microbial growth and moisture inspection. Here we're looking for the verifier to go in and just confirm that there's no signs of discoloration or growth on the ceilings or walls you know, really kind of doing that visual check to make sure that everything looks okay. Um, and then there are two references to EPA documents, what to do if there is remediation. Um, one of the practices that is voluntary, not required, but available for points is providing a sound barrier um, that would meet the minimum criteria and there would be points available either for single family or for multifamily for this particular practice. Another new practice is that points are available for furniture in the common areas. So this is for multifamily buildings, obviously. Um, if they meet the VOC levels in ANSI BIFMA E3 Furniture Sustainability Standard um, and that they're tested to that um, standard. And then there are points available for ventilation systems that comply with ASHRAE 62.1 and have an explanation of the importance of that in the operation, um, operations manual. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, chapter 10, operation and maintenance. Um, there are a lot of changes in this particular chapter. So, um, Lots of required manuals and training, important for you to know about. So building construction manual, mandatory. Some of the information that you provide there will earn points. It does have to include warranty, warranty operation and maintenance instructions for equipment, fixtures, appliances, and finishes, but it's required. Operations manual and the maintenance manual, both of those also mandatory. 
Again, some of the information that's put in there will earn points towards the Chapter 10 compliance, um, but you have to do both of those manuals. Um, it does require a list of practices to save water and energy and a maintenance checklist. And then last, um, and I'm pretty sure that this was new, on-site owner training. So regarding the equipment, operation and maintenance, control systems, and occupant act actions that will improve the building's environmental performance. Um, so that will have to be done. So um, really important because there are a lot of mandatory practices here. Um, but again, practices that I think the consensus committee thought were really important towards trying to ensure that that building is going to perform the way it was designed and constructed to in the future. Occupant training and occupant manuals also required. Um, there's a new mandatory practice within the manual for occupants. Um, <clears throat> there are three required items in total, and then there's up to three additional points for the non-mandatory items. New to this section is that occupants must be trained, mandatory. Um, points are available for having either a training outline video or website for tenants, and there are, there's a list of required minimum content. So how are you going to deliver the training? Um, how will the verifiers ensure the training is being delivered? Again, the, the training can be provided by video. It can be provided on the website. There's no problem with that. Um, and that can be something that the verifier will be able to take a look at. Um, but you're going to have to make sure that the occupants that are going into those buildings know what they're doing going forward to make sure that that building can continue to be high, um, high performing in the future. Okay, we're a little more than halfway through, just so you know. So I will, I will break for questions, but let me get through um, the next three little sections. Um, chapter 11. Remodeling, as I mentioned, there was really a wholesale revision of this chapter. The task group took the chapter, ripped it up, and decided they wanted to sort of start all over. Um, but let me, again, step back and say, um, I think the reason that they did this is because they had seen that there had been a huge increase in multifamily buildings seeking certification after remodeling. Um, for so long in the past 10 years, most of the buildings in GBS Green has been certified and have been new construction, and that really changed in the last few years. And we've seen um, everything from garden-style apartment buildings to high-rise. We've seen lots of conversions, so old commercial buildings or even industrial buildings being converted into existing multifamily or being converted into the uh, multifamily. Um, and as to the reasons why this is, our speculation is that some of it has to do with the fairly significant benefit HUD is providing with their mortgage insurance premium reduction. Those um, studies that have shown increased building valuation, particularly on the multifamily side for buildings that have a green certification, improved marketability, and then of course the savings from efficiency improvements. Um, and then quite honestly, if I'm really honest, I would say, I think until fairly recently, a lot of people just didn't know the NGBS applied to existing buildings and renovation, right? So we kind of ch turned that corner where more people realized, oh, the NGBS can be used for existing buildings. So what did they do? First and foremost, in addition to the performance path for energy and water efficiency, they added a prescriptive path. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But they did maintain that performance path option. And then again, importantly, they allowed a three-year look back for model activities, as long as there's documentation to prove what the baseline condition was. And the reason was is that the consensus committee really heard a lot about existing multifamily buildings that are occupied, how the owners will often do those renovations in phases, um, because they're not emptying out the whole building and renovating it and then having it re-leased up. And so we didn't want to discourage those buildings from earning a green certification so long as they could prove what the uh, renovations were done and what improvement that brought about with regard to um, increased performance. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Chapter 11, because again, you might not even known we do existing buildings, let me just review generally the way it works. The Chapter 11 practices, um, the numbers parallel the new construction. So we just went through for new construction chapters five through chapter 10, and those deal with new construction. All of the practices for renovation are in one chapter, chapter 11. 
But generally the way it would work is that um, say 505.5, which is something from chapter five, obviously for lot development, we put an 11 in front of it and then that becomes the practice for renovation. So the numbers are gonna parallel. They've been modified slightly as necessary if it makes more sense for renovation. Um, and the practices for renovation are only required when relevant. So for example, if you have a mandatory practice that has to do with towel backing, backed materials, if the building owner is not changing the bathroom or taking the tile out in any way, nothing has to happen. As long as the verifier does not see any moisture or water issues, nothing has to be changed with regards to those um, tile backed materials that practice is not mandatory for that building. So it's only where relevant. If the building owner was removing that tile and redoing that bathroom, then that practice would be mandatory. In addition, anything in the existing building that already complies with the practice can earn that building point. So obviously, if the building is in an area of high intersection density, for example, that building can earn the points and recognize the fact that it's in an area um, where people are likely to walk. So um, they would be eligible to earn those points. So I mentioned there has always been the performance path. Now there's a prescriptive path for energy and water, and you can mix and match those. So a building can choose to use the performance path for energy efficiency and the prescriptive path for water efficiency, or both performance path or both prescri prescriptive path. It's completely up to the building and what makes sense the most sense. For the remaining green categories, the building has to earn enough points for the desired certification level. And there's no minimum point requirement for each category like new construction. So let me show you this chart here. So you'll see, for example, for bronze, for everything except for water and energy efficiency, so lot development, resource efficiency, indoor environmental air uh, quality and operations and, ma and maintenance, the building has to earn a total of 88 points in all of those practices for that, then it has to demonstrate sufficient energy and water efficiency. If they were to use the prescriptive path for energy, they would need, again for bronze, 30 points for um, bronze certification or 45 points for silver for certification for the energy prescriptive path. For the water prescriptive path, they would need 25 points or 39 points, et cetera, um, for the water prescriptive path. If they want to use the performance path for water energy, essentially what we're doing is asking the verifier to go in and figure out what is the baseline energy and water use, or I should say energy or water use, for that building pre-renovation. So set the baseline that way. And then the reduction is the difference between consumption before and after the remodel. So if they were going to follow the performance path for energy, the building would have to be 15% more energy efficient at the end of the remodel than it was before the remodel, or 25% obviously for silver. And then for water, 20% more efficient for bronze, 30% for silver. But again, you can mix and match. So I could use the performance path for water, but I wanna go back and maybe use the prescriptive path for energy. Just a way to give more flexibility to building owners. Um, for those of you who have projects that, um, or buildings that might want to use Chapter 11, there is embedded in the NGBS Green Scoring Tool um, a calculator tool um, that is optional but can be very helpful. Um, and you can go in there and that will help you calculate what the reduction in energy and water um, use is. Now let's um, move on. I'm going to just take a sip of water. Let's move on to chapter 12. So this is entirely new, um, has not been um, in the NGBS previously. Um, and this is the certified path for single family homes, townhouses, and duplexes. So the idea here was um, the consensus committee got a chance to look at that chart I showed you earlier, um, although they had one or two years less data, where single family home certification has been relatively flat. Multifamily has grown. And there was a robust debate about how do we get more single family home builders to consider getting NGBS green certification? 
And one of the issues that came up was that for some of the larger production builders, they have an enormous number of models across all of their divisions. And then when you change up the features that home buyers have an opportunity to change, for verifiers, like literally they're doing hundreds and hundreds of scoring spreadsheets and it's, it's a just logistical nightmare. And it was just too complicated in many ways for them in a cost-effective, affordable way to figure out how to be compliant. So the idea with Chapter 12 was <clears throat> more like um, Energy Star in that that's a binary system. All the practices are mandatory. So it's more like a checklist approach. So if a single family home or townhouse would like to use Chapter 12 and earn certified, it's going to have to meet all of the mandatory practices, all the practices in Chapter 12, because they're all mandatory. Um, and compliance will earn them certified. In general, if you were to look through previously the chapters five through 10, what was mandatory in those practices, many of those were moved over to chapter um, 12, kind of again, setting that baseline. But they really wanted to focus on what were the most impactful green measures? Those that dealt with energy and water efficiency, certainly those that dealt with moisture and mold management, and those that had an effect on indoor air quality. Our calculations um, in looking at what the path required from an energy perspective would find homes that are compliant with this path to be roughly 7.5% above the 2018 IECC. So again, if you were to follow the traditional new construction path, that would be roughly the silver level for energy efficiency. So definitely a rigorous path, but intended to be a little bit more streamlined and easier. Um, every home must be third-party verified, which also will increase the compliance and the quality, and there's no sampling whatsoever required for this path. So we're really excited about going forward and talking to this about um, um, with new builders who have not used the program, um, certainly larger builders, but there's no limitation on volume. So if there's a small builder who's maybe been hesitant to get involved and get their home certified, this might be the path to do it. Okay, chapter 13. Um, the commercial space. So, as always, getting the residential portion of a mixed-use building, um, a developer can continue to do that. However, um, now there is an option for um, having the certification of the non-residential space, but it's optional, and that's entirely new. So, the owner of the building can choose to either get the residential portion plus the corn shell or the residential portion plus the full fitted out finished space. They have to get the residential portion certified. That's not a choice. And it works similar to that chapter 12. It's one level that that commercial space is certified if it's compliant and it has to meet all the practices because they're all mandatory. The chapter 13 sections also, they're going to be familiar to you. They deal with bicycle parking, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, the same kind of ideas that you've seen in the other sections of the NGBS. So for corn shell, this would be for those building owners that um, maybe don't have tenants, maybe aren't interested in getting the full fitted out space certified, just want the entire building certified. Um, they're going to have to make sure that they meet all the requirements for um, the exterior air barrier, the insulation, air sealing, and fenestration requirements. Um, and we are expecting the verifiers to verify this at the time of certification, so it can happen all at the same time. For the full fit-out certification option, um, this would be where the commercial space has a tenant or multiple tenants and has everything in there that they're going to have. It's not just raw concrete space. Again, all of the relevant practices are mandatory. Um, there's a much more extensive list of those. Um, I'm going to show you just briefly all the things that they cover, but I'm not going to talk to them in detail. And then verification and certification can occur at the same time as the residential portion or afterwards, depending on the leasing schedule. So perhaps the residential portion is completed, get leased up, we can certify that. And then the building owner decides to come in later on when they finally do have a tenant, um, they can do that as well. It would change the fee slightly, 
um, but that would be an option for them to consider. So again, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of these individual practices, but when you look in Chapter 13 for the practices that deal with resource efficiency, these are the kind of things that they're looking for. Damp proof below grade walls, flashing, ice barriers, architectural features, a C&D waste management plan, um, and there are practices around material selection. For energy efficiency, again, things that you would expect. Um, I talked about some of the things with regard to the thermal envelope and inflation, but for the full fitted out space, looking for individual energy meters for the space, efficient HVAC, looking at the lighting, the water heating, doing sizing calculations, and then definitely um, looking to get that space be energy efficient above a number of different baselines that are set. Water efficiency is making sure that the fixtures going in are water efficient. And of course, because the variety of uses in the spaces can be so broad, including everything from food waste disposal to water softeners, um, pre-rinse sprays. And then indoor air quality, things that you would expect, similar practice to what you've seen in the new construction side with regard to um, walk-off mats, protected HVAC ducts, MERV filters, um, either spot and building ventilation, and then radon mitigation. And then last, because we always want to make sure that these spaces are turned over and they can be operated um, high, in a high performance way, um, a tenant operation and ma maintenance manual for the initial tenants, and then the finished out ma manual for tenants prior to the start of construction for the non-residential space. Um, just very quickly, the process for this is that um, Either new construction or renovation would be eligible to have the commercial space certified. Um, the most basic requirement is that the residential space in the building has to be more than 50% of the gross floor area. Um, at registration, the verifier will have the choice of saying, is it just going to be the residential portion or is it going to be the commercial portion as well? The certification decision really can be revised if you decide to add it later on. As long as it's done before the first inspection happens, there won't be an additional fee. We can handle that administratively. And then when the building is finally certified, um, the owner or the building developer will have the choice of do they want one certificate for the whole building or are they looking for one certificate for the residential portion and then one certificate or multiple certificates for the commercial retail portion. There's a brand new scoring tool. Um, for the commercial space. Something new that you should be mindful of going forward is that previously new construction, you did single family homes and multifamily buildings with one scoring spreadsheet. Now there will be a single family new construction scoring spreadsheet that will not obviously have the commercial space worksheet. And then there's going to be one for multifamily that does have the commercial space worksheets as options if you choose to. So with that, that was 78 slides. Um, it's 2.53. I'm going to stop right there and open it up for any questions that anybody has. I've talked everybody into submission. Surely there's a question. Michelle, Joseph asked, are there any changes to duck and envelope testing requirements or any new performance testing requirements? Um, oh my goodness, Cindy, you want to help me out? I don't know if I remember <laughs> yeah. specifically. Go ahead. Yeah, so when we release an updated VRG in the next coming weeks, there will be new policies added, and specifically there will be an energy efficiency testing policy and an energy efficiency modeling policy. Um, with regard to duck and envelope testing requirements, I don't think that there's specifically are changes, but it's gonna be all of our guidance in one place and have specific callouts for professional qualifications um, and reference standards for testing. All right. Bill asked, is NGBS equivalent to LEED? Michelle, do you want to take that one? Yes. So um, I would argue NGBS is actually more rigorous than LEED. And the reason I say that is that um, 
unlike LEED, which is a total points towards certification, right? So if I get it right, you need 70 points to get certified out of 100 points. I think the NGBS is more rigorous because you have to meet those point minimums um, for every single category. And when you go up in level, we know that a silver level building is more energy efficient, is more water efficient than a bronze level building. Now, having said that, most jurisdictions that recognize um, a green certification program, including um, the different HUD programs, recognize LEED um, equivalent to NGBS. So I would say for argument's sake, yes, for sure. We have not done a point by point comparison with the 2020 NGBS to LEED yet. We typically will do something a little bit more in depth we will go and do that in the future. But um, again, I can confidently say at least based on all the different federal agencies and jurisdictions that um, recognize a green certification program in almost every single case, they recognize the two programs as equivalent. The biggest difference is that we just don't do buildings that people don't really live in. They're not residentially used. Mm -hmm. All right, Tyler asks, is the ELR testing option available for multifamily <coughs> buildings under four stories in height? I believe yes, so. I, I believe that it's available for yes. everyone. I looked at this this morning and I believe that's right. Rachel asks, what is the new mandatory item in chapter eight? Oh, Rachel. Um, uh, I don't remember. It is not water sense qualified professional. <laughs> that was changed. Um, I don't. I don't remember off the top of my head. I will look it up and send you a note um, about that because I just don't recall what it is. I'm sorry. All right. Jacob asked a couple questions about the water rating index. He says, you mentioned that verifiers will need to get additional training to use the WRI. How will this training be conducted? Online training, webinar, or something else? And WIR is or is not required for Chapter 8. So in so terms of the training, from the, go ahead. Go um, ahead. in terms of training, it is optional. So verifiers <clears throat> have the choice to do the training or not, and it will be delivered very similarly to our existing verifier training, where you're going onto an online platform and doing the training online. Um, we haven't worked it all out yet. There might be some, um, you know, different exam um, formats than typical, but. Yeah, it's going to be online. And then in terms of whether or not WRIR is required, no, it's not required. It's an optional path. So similar to how there are multiple paths for compliance in the energy efficiency chapter, this is a new path in chapter eight. Okay, so next question, Rachel asks, will there be training on radon testing and microbial growth or would it be expected to use an expert in those areas? So based on my, what I've read and getting myself familiar with the 2020 NGBS, I would expect that for radon testing, you would probably be using um, some kind of firm that normally does that. And you'll just, as a verifier, you would just be collecting the results. So I would not expect the verifiers to actually do the radon testing themselves. For microbial growth, that's a great question, Rachel. And while we're not experts, we can certainly maybe put together a little something. I think the way the practice is written is intended for the verifier to sort of take a look. Um, we could also put in the VRG that if somebody else is an expert in that and makes a declaration that there is not a problem, we could accept that as well. But I actually think that that might be something that if we provide a little guidance and some information um, to the verifiers that that would be useful. When I was doing my research, looking at those two EPA documents to do the training and the other stuff we've been working on, um, I think compiling that would be useful for the verifiers. So we will look into that. Great. Kristen asks, would references to Energy Star low rise versus high rise be replaced with the new Energy Star multifamily new construction program? So we won't, it will, the standard NGBS is what it is and it will have the reference to um, high rise. However, in the VRG, we will make note of how you can use new construction. And in fact, 
because we knew that the consensus committee had used high rise and that Energy Star was changing it, we already got information from Energy Star as to what would be what. And so we'll be ready to go with that information right from the beginning. Um, Bill asks, will this video be available online to review and send to others who couldn't watch it today? Yes, our intention is to um, take the recording. It may take us a couple of days to do whatever they have to do to format it, but I would say by say mid next week, middle of next week, end of next week, we will post it in the resources section on homeinnovation.com backslash green go to that resources section and we'll post it there for everybody to um, access. Daryl asked, do you have a rough date on when we can start to use the program? So we understand um, that it will take um, NHB about four to five weeks to get the publication done and out and available we will be ready to launch the day that the publication comes out. So <clears throat> registration, all of that, all of that will, the, um, everything the verifiers need will be up and running the day that the actual publication is available, whether that's digitally or in print format. Um, we're very close to being ready right now, but we're going to wait obviously until you can get a copy of the standard um, before we release that. So let's say if this is middle of February, hopefully mid-March, um, ideally, we'll be up and running and ready to go. I actually think my prediction is that there will be a number of projects that might want to skip right over the 2015 and go straight to the 2020 because of some of the new changes. Um, and so I encourage those of you who are not verifiers on the phone, um, those of you who are builders, developers, architects, or projects, to have a conversation with your verifier of choice, um, to explore that, and to look to see if that's a good opportunity. And then for all of those um, verifiers that are on the phone, that the minute we release that training, to get into the training, you'll have to earn your 2020 NGBS Green accreditation, um, uh, take the test, and then you'll be good to go to um, do a rough inspection. Verifiers will be able to register projects without actually having their 2020 NGBS Green Verifier accreditation, but they will not be able to submit a rough inspection notification without that credential. All right, that's all the questions that are in the chat box right now, but we did schedule till 3.15, so if anyone else has anything that's coming to mind, we'll stay on the line a few more minutes. And then the last thing I'll just say, you know, um, I made reference to we have um, a good amount of new marketing materials. We don't have a date yet, but we will certainly have put together a, uh, we'll have another webinar specifically on the new marketing opportunities. Um, for the verifiers, we did include in the new 2020 NGBS training a specific section on the new marketing materials. So look for that. Um, um, we're excited to get feedback on what we've put together and hopefully that will provide value. Um, and we are very excited to start to hear feedback from both verifiers and builders alike on the new scoring tools. <clears throat> so because there's so many extensive changes um, in the 2020 NGBS, we have lots of new tools and there's new functionality and it's going to look a little different and it'll be a little hard going forward. Um, I would ask you to be a little patient with us because we don't like to have lots of new versions coming out as we make changes, but it's inevitable in the beginning whenever there's a new NGBS um, version that comes out. Cindy has overseen the entire process of developing the new scoring tools and really has done this yeoman's work of working with the verifiers, having them do lots of beta testing, working on the functionality, they look better, I think they're gonna work a lot better. 
Um, but again, we're really open to the feedback you have when you first have access to those um, to let us know how they're working, what you think. Um, and we intend to see if we can get a couple of YouTube videos up um, that will be open and available to everybody on using those new scoring tools. So typically those we will <clears throat> just record. Maybe we'll do a webinar if we get good feedback that that's something you would want, or we'll just record it, have Cindy using the tool, and then put that up on YouTube and release that link so that you can watch it. We like to do kind of little short snippets so that they're not overwhelming, but you can kind of get in and really learn the functionality. So look for that coming out as well. Mm -hmm. And we'll likely also have webinars coming up about the water rating index tool specifically and probably also the NGBS Green Plus badges that Michelle mentioned earlier. So last call for questions. All right, so I guess, Cindy, we should call us a wrap. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us today. There's always a contact us um, on our website at homeinnovation.com backslash green if you want to ask a question that we didn't answer or you think about later. Um, and we're really looking forward to working with you on the 2020 NGBS.